the space between daunting. <laughs> so when I was 11 years old, I was granted an incredible opportunity. I was offered a full scholarship to an elite private middle school. This was a really big deal for my family. At the time, my three sisters, mother and I, were living in a really crammed one-bedroom apartment in Los Angeles. I slept on the mattress with my sister in the living room, and when I needed some quiet to do my homework, I went into my mother's parked minivan. On the first day of middle school, I remember getting there and being really confused because there were dozens of backpacks strewn all across the ground. And the first thing I thought was, aren't they afraid that their stuff's going to get stolen? I mean, we couldn't be more different. I was a poor Latina from the Northeast Los Angeles, and most of my classmates were white, affluent, and lived in Pasadena. Being the scholarship kid forced me, to, forced me into a space between worlds. For years, I felt out of place. At home, I felt frustrated and stuck. And at school, I felt completely alienated and insecure. And those first few weeks were total culture shock. I realized that I apparently speak with an accent, that my English is not grammatically correct, and that I was an entire half a year behind all of my other classmates, even though I was at the top of my class when I was in elementary school. So everywhere I turned, I saw these stark social, economic, cultural differences that kept my class classmates and I apart. And eventually, to cope, I learned how to compartmentalize these two worlds. When my mom asked me about school, I didn't say much. And I never brought any of my friends to my house, and I never spoke about what was going on in my family, even when my father was deported when I was in high school. I just kept these two worlds apart. And it was only through photography that I was able to somehow have these two places exist together. So I would take photographs of my neighborhood, of my friends, of the wall that was crumbling in my mom's apartment. And when I would walk down the hallway in my high school, it gave me some comfort to know that even though I wasn't brave enough then to talk about my life and my reality, that somehow these two places were coexisting in one physical space. So sometimes these these chasms, these gaps felt like canyons for me. Like I remember this one time when uh, we went to visit a friend of ours. Her family, her parents had just divorced and it was understood that things were pretty bad and financially they were going through some hardships. So I remember arriving to her house and immediately recognizing where I was. It turns out that my mom had cleaned that house when I was growing up. This is one of the families that my mom, this is one of the many houses that my mom had worked at. And when I was sitting there, I remember going up and down, running up and down those steps when I was a little kid and I would go with my mom, either to help her out, or tag along. And I remember I just sat there and I didn't say anything. And I remember thinking, maybe I will never talk about this experience. Like maybe that's something I just will never share. So other times, these chasms, though, were just surreal and, and spectacular, like the time that Kevin Costner made me French toast for breakfast. I know, it sounds really crazy, but it's a true story. I went to school with his daughter, and I remember while he was flipping the French toast thinking, ah, oh, so close, but so far away. <laughs> So there were tons of these moments, and it was very confusing to be in this space and to be in another, and to feel like these things could never come together. So in some ways, it's kind of crazy that I decided to become a community organizer, because it's a profession that forces you to constantly be interacting with all sorts of people, and constantly being forced into awkward situations that create tension, but in a productive way, I would argue. So as an organizer, I feel like I'm often putting together a Thanksgiving dinner where you know that there are going to be a dysfunctional relative that says something that offends someone else, or that there's going to be some kind of tension, but hopefully everyone stays at the table, and hopefully everyone's voice is valued. And that's been the work that I've been engaged in as an immigrant rights organizer, uh, fighting against mass deportation programs, fighting against anti, 
uh, immigrant to fills that even Desmond Tutu described as apartheid-like. And it's been the goal of organizing to acknowledge those differences, but as I mentioned, focus on the things that do make us similar, focus on that common purpose, and actually move forward. And personally, one of the reasons why organizing has been great and transformative for me, even though it's constantly making me be in this situation in between worlds, whether I'm flyering at a day labor corner, or I'm holding together a coalition meeting, or I'm organizing a march, or testifying before a judge about the need for government transparency. What I love is that I can be myself in all of those places, that that it's a good thing to bring up issues of race and inequality in, in spaces where maybe that issue wasn't talked about, that I could talk about my life story and the fact that my father was deported, and I, and I don't have to compartmentalize my life in, in, in that way, and that it's a good thing that you know a sheriff has to listen to someone who's, whose father was deported or someone had, was forced to think about something that they didn't have to think about before. So this past year, um, I had one of the most, um, the biggest personal and professional accomplishments of my life. I worked on a campaign here in Washington, D.C. for over three years. The goal of the campaign was to stop this massive deportation program coming into the nation's capital. And as part of that work, I built together, again, a coalition, right, with domestic violence uh, groups against domestic violence, criminal justice groups, um, civil rights groups, immigrant rights groups, and we all came together and we were able to successfully lobby the DC Council to pass a law. And that law passed just this uh, past summer, and it essentially says that the DC government is not going to help in the deportations of people who are our fathers, our mothers, our spouses, our partners here in Washington, D.C. And that law um, has become a national model across the country and other places like California and Massachusetts are trying to implement it. So this was a huge victory uh, for me, not only because it means that literally thousands of families in Washington, D.C. are not going to have to face what my family faced, but also when I was pushing for the bill, there was a hearing, and I, for the first time, had the courage to sit down in this room full of people from all different backgrounds, from all different kinds of sectors of life, and tell my life story, and, t and sit there in front of the DC Council and say, you know, when I was in high school, my father was deported, and he wasn't able to come to my graduation for college because he had, at that point, already passed away. And it was the first time that I was able, like, it, it, it came full circle. I was able to be who I was in public and kind of bring all of my worlds together. Thank you.